Amen. So we're we're in a we're in a series, and this is this is uh, this is segment six of this series that I didn't think we would go this far, but I want to I want to talk to you about some a very specific area, and that is I want to talk to you about the Father's DNA. Because how many of you know we get we get DNA from our parents, and spiritually speaking, from our heavenly Father. That's where our spiritual DNA comes from. You know, with that DNA is encoded certain characteristics, right? Certain characteristics that we have. And that's in the physical realm, but I believe there's a parallel in the supernatural spiritual realm that we have certain characteristics that come in the package with our salvation because God is, we're, gonna, we're supposed to be like him, amen? And the scripture says in the New Testament that as he, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. That's a powerful statement. But you know what? When I, when I say that, when I quote that scripture that as he is, so are we in this world, most of us think about how he was. We think about when he walked the dusty streets. And we think about when he uh, spit in the clay and made mud and wiped it in the, in the eye of the blind person and he began to see. And that's powerful. And he never changes, so that's still a part of it. But the scripture doesn't say, as he was, so are we. It says, as he is, so are we. And if you ever read over in John and you read in the Revelation and see how he is in his glorified state, he's more powerful, more splendid, more authoritative than he ever was even on this earth because he he has transcended those limitations. And you know what? I just choose to believe, even if I don't understand it, even if I can't necessarily walk in all of it right now, I just choose to believe that what the word says about me is true. And if it says, as he is, so am I, then praise God, that's who I am. Why? Because I get my DNA from the Father. So when I talk about DNA, I'm using that as a, as a device to talk about characteristics. Uh, it, the theologians like to use the the term attributes, the attributes of God, the characteristics of God. This is, this is who he is. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's all powerful. In other words, all knowing, but he's also kind. He's also, uh, he's also ultimate love. He's also, there's no shadow of turning in, in him. He, he's perfect. So he doesn't need to change. He's, he's right as he is. And for someone who's perfect to change would be to go in the wrong direction. But I'm so thankful for this. I know I'm not perfect, but because my father's perfect, I'm being perfected. I know I'm not omniscient, but I know the one who knows everything. So I know that as I commune with him, I can know everything I need to know when I need to know it. That's why I don't, I don't like to say, oh, I don't know what to do. I might not know what to do right now, but I'm just declaring by faith that because my father knows everything, that I'll know what I need to know. Amen. That's DNA. That's the characteristics of God. So the Father's DNA. Let me, let me read to you a couple of scriptures that just talk about family and God as a father before we jump in. Because we're going to focus on one particular attribute of God today. But from the King James, Psalms chapter 68, verse 5 and 6. A father of the fatherless. This is who God is. A father of the fatherless. He's a father. He's a judge of the widows. Now, before I finish reading that, I want to I want to jump in here with just a little bit of teaching about this word fatherless. It does mean orphan, but it also comes from a Hebrew word, and that root word means to be lonely or alone. So if you're not an orphan, you can still be lonely or alone. Well, Father, God wants to be a father to you and step into that vacuum, that vacuum of loneliness, that vacuum of rejection and be the healing party, to be the friend of the friendless as well as a father to the fatherless. He's a judge of the widows. It means he he is a protector of the widows. He's a protector of those who have no protection of their own. He's an advocate for the widow. This is who he is in his holy habitation. Verse six, God sets the solitary in families. He sets the solitary in families. You know, God is a family God. 
And I believe the reason for the creation of man is that God wanted to express himself as father. And to do that, you need a family. And I believe the story of redemption all through the Old Testament, which Jesus said every book in that Old Testament was about him. I believe that Old Testament into the New Testament story is the story of a father coming to rescue his family and redeem it back from slavery. Thank God for that. God sets the solitary or the lonely again in families. He brings out those who are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a, dwell in a dry land. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Pause for effect. <laughs> love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. You know, I think there's a, there's a place of spiritual maturity that happens when we understand that God wants for our enemies the same thing he wants for us. And that the person who persecutes us the, us the most is lost, but redeemed potentially by the blood of Jesus. They just need to know that it's available. I heard somebody teaching on marriage one day say that we ought to treat our spouses like, the, like Jesus said we should treat our enemies. And that is we should pray for them. I mean, that should, that should be the start. Hey, if you're complaining about your spouse, you're missing some ground for prayer. Because if it's worth complaining about, it's worth praying about. I'm just scanning for little nudges and elbow. Hey, we're a work in progress. Thank you for that one. Yes, we are. I know. Let me, let, okay, maybe you're not. I'm a work in progress. I'm, I'm definitely not perfect. And uh, I'm not even close, but thank God I'm on my way. It's like the preacher said, you know, I may not have arrived, but at least I left. <laughs> we're, all, we're on our way. And I think this is interesting. If we love our enemies, we're being like our father. It's like the DNA is kicking in, those characteristics of God. Because it goes on to say, he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. That's God. which kind of takes those God get them prayers and kind of says, you know what? I might not be praying the right way because my DNA is forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, our spiritual DNA comes from our heavenly father. It, it's like, uh, what's the saying? The apple doesn't fall far from the, and uh, uh, that, that one's just a chip off the old, mm-hmm. So our DNA, when we talk about spiritual DNA, it means that, that, that like father, like son, like father, like daughter. See, our culture, our beliefs, our, our practices. I mean, the communion table represents the family table. And it's interesting to me that God... In, in, in creation and in his wisdom and omniscience that he wanted to leave us with an example to remember him by. And what he does is he provides a meal and says, come to the table. Because that's where families rub shoulders. That's where families learn values. That's where kids learn who they are and who mom and dad are. And, and, and all of that takes place around the table. And it's, it's our behavior, our beliefs, our culture that come from our dad and from our spiritual DNA. And you find, out, you find out who you really are when you're under pressure. It's true. In 2000, March of 2000, uh, there was a tornado that came through Fort Worth and it hit a lot of the downtown area. And uh, it destroyed the church where I was working where, where later on Amy would work. Uh, you know, you can, you can Google it and see pictures of that church. 
It's just, it, it was amazing the level of destruction. What's amazing how, how you find out about people's spiritual DNA and whether it comes from the father or not when you have pressure like that. Uh, this was right before Easter. It was right before Easter. And uh, South Cliff Baptist had the, uh, the space, the meeting space at uh, Will Rogers. And they said, you know what? We, we have a church building and we can have multiple services, even though that wasn't the best thing for them to celebrate. They wanted to celebrate as a family, but they said, here, you take it. That's some spiritual DNA. We had some spirit-filled churches that you would think would be like charismatic, like faith, that uh, just flat out told people, told the press, there must be something wrong. They're doing something wrong or the enemy, would, you know. It was like they, they equated it to judgment, that we were messed up, so it was judgment. And this was a big building. That, that building was 100,000 square feet. Beautiful stained glass, dome ceiling in the, some of you probably been in it, was the former First Baptist Church. So it's kind of interesting. We had, we had people who you would think had the same DNA that, that showed that they weren't, they weren't, at least they weren't representing the Father's DNA well. And then we had churches that weren't even Christian send us offerings. And it's just amazing. You see where people are coming from when, when pressure is put on them. I mean, this is interesting. This was interesting. You find out who kind of has the real culture because we had to move. And in the move, we not only moved, we had to change service times to like three in the afternoon. And there were some people who church was all about Sunday morning, so they couldn't, they couldn't hang with us anymore. We lost about half our crew in, in, that, in that move because they had to go to church on, on Sunday morning. Couldn't be the same on, on the afternoon. And my favorite, my favorite excuse for leaving uh, the church was this. This lady said, the church just, it's too far for me now. Because we moved from downtown, like in the, on the outskirts of downtown, to uh, I-35. And I don't know what happened. Somebody, somebody said, well, I know where that lady lives. We actually moved three miles closer to her. Which says to me, if you're looking for an excuse to bolt, you'll, you, you'll take any opportunity. But thank God for people who have the DNA and have a heart for the house. It's our DNA to come together. It's our DNA to assemble ourselves together. It's a DNA thing for us to be a part of a family. So in my remaining three hours, let me give you three quick points. I know some of y'all just egged me on, I know. Some of y'all come from the day of the three hour service. I've prayed this prayer many a time. God, beam me up. Get me out of here. I don't mind long service as long as something's happening. Because then the time doesn't matter. Talking about the Father's DNA, and particularly one aspect, because we can't, I mean, there's all kinds of aspects, but we're going to dive in for just a minute about the faithfulness of God. If you don't know anything else after today, you should know that God is faithful. And I'm, I might even ask you to say that with me. I think I will just say that with me. God is faithful. Let's try that one more time. God is faithful. I mean, turn to, turn to the, your neighbor right there and just look at him in the eye. Go ahead, look at him in the eye. Tell him God is faithful. God is faithful. Listen, God's been faithful to you in your past and he is faithful to you in your future because he is already there. He was a healer in the past. He's a healer now. He's faithful. God, if he ever answered a prayer for you, he's faithful today still to answer prayer. We have this confidence in him because he loves us and we know that he hears us when we pray. We know that we have the petitions we've asked of him. We know that if he calls us John, then we need to call ourselves John. Talking about Zechariah, we, we jumped into that. But faithfulness is a part of God's DNA. 
Know therefore the Lord, your God is God. That means he's in charge. Nobody higher. God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Listen, God is faithful today and a thousand generations from now, he'll still be faithful. His word was true a thousand years ago. It's true today and a thousand years from now, it will still be truth. And if it takes him a thousand years to answer your prayer request, he will work it out and your prayer request will be answered. I mean, there were prayer requests, we, prayer requests, there were, there were prophetic words and prayers that we prayed at that church prior to it being hit by that tornado. And until the day that the doors closed and the property was sold to another church, those prophetic words were out there. One of the things we prayed for years was that God would fill every seat, every service. It was never manifested to us with exception of rare occasion. I mean, the couple of times that we had uh, Joyce Meyer and uh, she came right after the tornado just to help out. I mean, where there was a traffic jam, every seat was filled. So we saw a prophetic, in, in essence, a prophetic answer to our prayer. But you know what? The church building was sold to another charismatic church who when they moved in there, they filled that place. And those prayers that we prayed have been answered. They just didn't answer. We just didn't get the answer we thought we were getting. You know, a lot of times we like to interpret the prophetic words we have. And it's always like through our filter and us as the central figure. We are not always the center of God's prophetic action. But thank God we can have a part of bringing things to pass. And what we don't see with our own eyes, hey, we're just passing the baton. We're not, listen, I could trace your spiritual lineage back to the day of Pentecost. Because when Peter stood up and preached to that 3,000 and people were born again, they went out and told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who told somebody that eventually told somebody who got born again and they were a witness and told you about Jesus or brought you to church. Your spiritual DNA didn't just happen yesterday. You're connected to thousands of years of church history. That impacts me probably more than it did you. I need to hurry. See, God is the constant. Your situation is the variable. And if your situation doesn't line up with what God's word says, guess who's gonna change? Not God. Your prayer does not change God, but your situation is the variable and it has to change because God is not changing. Somebody say amen. Listen, I understand people may have been unfaithful to you, but God is faithful. Your friend might have been disloyal to you, but God is faithful. See, God's character stands opposite to the spirit of this world. He's faithful. He's been faithful in your past. He's faithful in your present and he's faithful in your future. Psalm 145, verse 13, the psalmist says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Hallelujah, aren't you glad? And your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. God is faithful. If you look it up in the dictionary, it simply means this. He's absolutely trustworthy. He's completely dependable. He is totally loyal and steadfast. And I love what Webster's 1828 dictionary says. It says faithfulness means constant, to be constant, not fickle. Don't raise your hand and don't point, but have you ever known anybody that was fickle? I think it's kind of the spirit of this age. You ask people today, hey, would you like to go out and uh, get a pizza this Friday? And they'll a lot of times put you off because they're waiting to see what else is gonna come out. To me, that's fickle. Be constant, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be constant, if you say you're gonna show, then show. Because he's faithful, that's our DNA. And we may, we may have to do some learning curve, but thank God we're on the way because it's in us. It's in us to be constant. It's in us to be trustworthy. You remember Abraham? 
Does everybody know who Abraham is? Anybody not know who Abraham is? Okay, because I'll you can't assume you can't assume people know anymore. But Abraham counted on God's faithfulness. He had a prophetic word that he was going to have a family and offspring that were impossible to, to number, impossible to count. And, you know, as the years ticked by, as he was 75, 80, 85, 90, and still no child, you would think most people would be shook. But Romans chapter 4, Paul writes this. He said, no one belief made Abraham waver. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Fully persuaded, fully convinced of the faithfulness of God. See, faith has no foundation without the faithfulness of God. I mean, the group that says you never know what God will do obviously hadn't read this. Because this tells you what he will do. And even more importantly, it tells you what he has already done. James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Interesting term, the Father of lights, with whom is no variation or shadow due to change. You know, anytime the Father of something comes up, it should take us back to the beginning, to Genesis. He being the Father of lights means that he was the, he was the Father of the sun's consistency and the planetary uh, rotations. He did something that would produce seasons. And the, the scripture says in, in Genesis that those, those seasons, hot and cold, sowed seed time and harvest would never cease while the earth remained. Why? Because he's faithful. He's constant. He doesn't change. If you look at the heavens, the psalmist said, they preach about God. Their voice, he says, goes out through the entire world. And what is it saying? It's saying you can know where the planet is going to be precisely. Any, any planet you choose, you can know precisely where it will be, not only tomorrow, but a thousand years from now. That's the father of lights. That's his DNA. See, God's promise must come to pass because he's faithful. I'm going to back up and say that again until I get a better amen. God's promise has to come to pass because God is faithful. Man, y'all are doing good. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. I mean, a lot of churches preach like God does change his mind. I can't go into that. I want to. Has he said it and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will it not be fulfilled? See, his word is 100% true 100% of the time. His promise is good. See, he does everything he says he will do because God is faithful. If he promised it, there's going to be a performance. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what the angel told Mary before the birth of Christ. He promised it, and there is going to be a performance of those things which he told you from the Lord. And I'm just delivering that same message today because God is faithful. I can tell you this. There will be a performance of what God has promised to you. He'll do everything we believe him for. If he said it, you can take it to the bank. God's faithful. I love this verse, Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. You have established the earth and it abides. Hallelujah.
Psalm 138.8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. He's going to perfect what concerns you. Notice it, it's not perfect. He will perfect it. And it was, it, it's that difference that the Hebrew actually has. To perfect means to complete or to perform. He's going to complete whatever it is that concerns you. He's going to perfect it, meaning he's going to bring it to the right conclusion. See, God is absolutely trustworthy. He's completely reliable, dependable, loyal, and steadfast. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for you. And I like what 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. I'm trying, I'm trying to convince somebody that God is faithful. God, Vine Fellowship, God is faithful. He's going to perfect what concerns you. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. What is, it, what is it God's promised you? There's some of you that need to blow the dust off that promise. Hallelujah. Blow the dust off that prophetic word. Get it shiny, get it bright. Hold it up again into the light and let him breathe new life on the inside of you. Because faithful is he who promised who also will do it. There is going to be a performance because he is faithful. His word must come to pass because God is faithful. If he said it, he will complete it because God is faithful. See, we don't, we don't have an end unless it's a good end because God is faithful. As long as we don't quit, as long as we don't give up, because God is faithful, we're going to come out on the right side. We're going to come out in victory. We're going to come out, and the promises of God will have come to pass. Preach it. Wow. Man, there's like little graphics and doodads up there. Your, your notes look better than my notes. I'm almost there. See, for God to be unfaithful would be to act contrary to his nature. And that's impossible. See, when he sent Jesus to the cross, he paid a perfect price, a terrible price, that covered every sin that would ever touch mankind even the ones that hadn't been invented yet, so to speak. When Jesus went to the cross, he bore the sickness, the suffering of all mankind. Just like he didn't leave any sin out, he didn't leave any sickness or disease out. And the fact that I may not make the connection, I may not know exactly how to by faith appropriate what grace has provided does not negate the fact that God promised it, nor the nor the fact that by his nature, he's a healer, he's a deliverer, he's a savior. I can't, I can't, I can't make God the enemy when it's the enemy who's the enemy. My God is good, the faithful God. His word is forever settled in heaven. Thank God for that. Every word that he speaks is true. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. He can't deny his DNA. And we shouldn't deny his DNA. I like what, I like what your dad used to tell us, Amy. He said, you know, instead of thinking, what if it doesn't work? When you go to pray for somebody, why not think, what if it does work? See, diligence and dependability are Christ-like behavior. It's part of our DNA structure. Those things are in us, whether we demonstrate them or not, they're in us. See, a person who consist consistently keeps her words 
will be known as faithful. If you say you're going to if you say you're going to do something, then bless God, do it. If you say you're going to be someplace, then be there. If you say you're going to if you say you're going to be there at a certain time, then be there at a certain time and don't make promises you do not intend to keep especially to yourself. Colossians 3, 9 and 10, do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in DNA after the DNA image of its creator. My addition there, but you get the point. God is faithful. See, our identity is faithfulness. Our identity, our nature is to be true to our word. Our nature is to be constant and not fickle. I like Proverbs 28, 20, the faithful will abound with blessings. The faithful will abound with blessings. Hallelujah. I just want to encourage you today that regardless of what you're facing or how long you faced it, God is the faithful God. And he's always going to make a way for us. Our DNA is family. It's the relationships. You know, when that tornado hit that church and later when it at that church closed its doors. The church is still the church. We found out that the house the family lives in is not the family. It's the relationships. And the, the great thing to tell, that I can tell you that about that church and about everything that happened is that that family is based on the relationships. And I still have those relationships. We may not meet together. We, not be, we may not be a church in the sense that you guys are a church today. But that congregation still exists. God's faithful. He's faithful to finish what he started. And you know what? There is a call. There is a mission on you. And I want you to look at me right here. You have a future. You have a future. You are in God's plan and you are in his future. And because God is faithful, every seed that's ever been sown into this church under whatever name it functioned at the time, every seed that's ever been sown, every word of blessing, every prayer is still active in God's heart. And that'll never cease because God is faithful. And he's faithful when we're not faithful. He's faithful when we're shaken. He's faithful when we're not sure that he's still faithful. He remains faithful because he can't deny himself. He is faithful. That's his DNA. That's all he has. He's perfectly good, perfectly the father, perfect love. And as long as we stick with him and stick together, everything turns out all right because God is faithful. You know, one of the constants we have is to be here in relationship with one another. And another constant we have has to do with the table. If Ed's around, he can come on up. Because we're coming to the table. And I love this. Whether we do it weekly or whether we do it monthly, there's a constant which I think represents that faithfulness of God. A lot of great things happen when we gather around the table. 